So I'm, I'm a bit of a mess today because I lost my glasses this week. Oh, no. So I'm using an old prescription. It's not as good. <laughs> my ears weren't charged. So I, 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 I we were talking before and I'm sitting there, I can't hear anything. I pulled them out and I could hear a little bit. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just a mess. I, <clears throat> when Tim, you shared that, I, I couldn't help but to think about our Ben. Um, when he was 15 years old, he got rushed to the hospital, and uh, you all prayed for him. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, he had a twisted intestines, mm -hmm. and uh, it was twisted four times, I believe. And they, um, you know, they usually when that happens whatever is twisted it it has to be cut out so for some reason even though the twists were there his intestines did not get cut um, he had to have two uh, a month in the hospital and, and and surgeries the interesting thing is is that both the doctors that did the two emergency surgeries they said to us you might see a difference in his growth patterns because we don't know how much was getting through in his intestines. And if you remember, little Ben, yeah. he's now a huge man. Yeah. And so he just, I think he grew, if I'm not mistaken, an inch while he was in the hospital. Hmm. So, uh, but again, I, you know, we go back to prayer. Mm -hmm. It works. And we don't understand it, but we, we pray because that's what we do. So there was a man, and he was shopping for a Valentine, uh, Valentine's gift for his wife. And he passed the cosmetic counter, and it occurred to him that perfume would be the perfect gift. So he asked the sales representative to show him some of the popular brands of perfume, because like most of us guys, we just don't know. And so she did, and the first bottle that she brought out uh, smelled great, and it was $150. <laughs> well, he looked at her and he said, well, that's a bit much. Do you have anything less expensive? So she brought out another brand, and it was $130. Mm -hmm. And she said, that's, uh, he said that's, that's still quite a bit. Do you have anything, any, anything cheaper? <laughs> so she brought out an armful of bottles, put them in front of him, ranging from $80 down to $18. And as she placed them in front, the man picked the $18 bottle of perfume. And pushing it aside, he said, um, still 18 bucks, That's, do you have anything cheaper? <laughs> and so she handed him a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> If you've ever given a gift to somebody that turned out to be, well, not so well received, you can understand. And I've been there uh, numerous times. I have brought my significant others a present on Christmas or their birthday, and it wasn't that they didn't appreciate it, but it wasn't necessarily what they wanted. And now to their credit, they said to me, oh, this is nice, thank you. But when you look at it and you see it still sitting on the shelf in the garage, you know you did something wrong. In our scripture today, we have an unnamed woman. The Apostle John tells us that it actually is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And this woman gives a gift of tremendous value to Jesus. So tremendous, it was scandalous. It caused people to go crazy. On the other hand, Jesus loved it. Her gift offended people. Her gift totally impressed God. And personally, I think that is way cool. It took great courage for her to give what she did, and it took sacrifice to give what she did, and she didn't even think about either one of those things. It took a lot of brave, uh, a, lot, a lot to brave the criticism in the end, 
And I think it changed your life. How can we do that? How can we let go so it pleases Jesus? Uh, giving a kidney is a pretty extravagant gift. I don't know how many of you know that some people that gave their kidney, one of their kidneys away. I, I, I have somebody that I know that did that, and I mean, you only have two, so if you're giving one away, you're kind of putting yourself a little bit at risk. Uh, it would be quite a decision that you would have to make to give a kidney away. And here in this passage, Mary gives a gift of such tremendous value that it's difficult for us in this day and age to comprehend exactly what the value of this was. Before we jump into the passage, Mark 14, 1 to 11, let me say that through this passage, a lot of people will, will talk about the issue of giving money. And that becomes a, pre a predominant sermon on this particular passage. And I don't think it's predominantly about money. I think it has a much deeper significance. I think it's about worship. Mm -hmm. I think it's about freedom. I think it's about receiving the blessings of God. The Gospel of Mark here in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, Jesus arrives at the, the, this vicinity in Jerusalem. And remember, because we've talked about it in previous weeks, he caused the chief priests and teachers of the law a whole lot of grief. Uh, they were ticked at him. Uh, he had been praised at the Messiah by some. Uh, he disrupted the temple. He overturned tables and got angry and whipped people and uh, causing quite a commotion. And even in the midst of these, these well-thought-out arguments against these leaders, um, he bested them. And they had to walk away knowing they were defeated. So these men wanted revenge. They had the power to get revenge. But they wanted to take revenge with the least complications necessary. You see, Jesus was popular with the people, so they somehow had to set Jesus up in a quiet place away from the people as far out of the public eye as they could. And the city of Jerusalem, uh, I've said it numerous times, it would swell with population at this particular time, the celebration of the Passover. Demonstrations and even riots would always be expected uh, with the, this increased amount of people because Passover celebrated the Lord God freeing the nation of Israel from the hand of Egypt uh, when they were under foreign government hands and they were at that point too under Rome. So this was a week where there was nationalistic passions that would get fanned and the situation could easily get out of control. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it's a lot like our nation right now. With the situation in Israel and Gaza. One of my students, her husband is NYPD. And he had to come back out of vacation to go on duty and be in uniform because of the demonstrations in the city. Well, it was like that then. Same type of scenario. And the Romans, who worked closely with the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they expected their help in keeping the population sort of subdued. Uh, if things got too wild, Rome would notice and if Rome noticed, the response would not be good for the local Romans or the chief priests or the teachers of the law, it would go down bad. So these Jewish leaders feel these followers of Jesus might be easily excitable, so they decide that they're not going to take Jesus until the end of the Passover. And people usually stayed about seven days and then they would start to leave and the population would start to decrease. And they would wait until the end of the celebration which there would be less chance of any kind of difficult situation coming up. With less people, less chance of riot, and they could act. 
So if we jump to verse 10, we see that Judas Iscariot is going to the chief priest to hand over Jesus. And what we see here in the Gospel of Mark is not necessarily in chronological order. And Mark's pretty good about that, but, but not necessarily in this particular thing. And I think Mark is attempting, not attempting to be, to be chronological here, but he's contrasting Mary and her anointing of Jesus with Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. And Mary kind of takes life as it comes, and it's contrasted against Judas, who has a plan, a life plan that isn't being fulfilled the way he wants or was expecting, and he is planned out. Being planned is important and needed, let's be honest. But life has a way of throwing us curveballs, and we can't be planned for those. So what do we do then? The primary concern of the Sanhedrin at that point, the ruling body of Jesus, was a riot. Judas offers an opportunity to arrest Jesus without this public disturbance. Judas is responding to the call, his call, not God's call. So they employ Judas, and they secretly schedule the, the setup, and the time is, is put into plan, and so that way they can quickly get Jesus quietly. And some, some people have, scholars have speculated that Jesus, uh, Judas was a plant, a secret agent of the Sanhedrin, and inserted into Jesus' inner circle. I, I don't think that was the case. Although Judas was not a Galilean like the other disciples, so maybe his loyalties were somewhere else. But all that is speculation. Most likely, Judas Iscariot, unlike Mary, was unable or unwilling to fully commit himself to Jesus Christ. He had another agenda. Full commitment to Jesus means this. I serve Jesus come what may. Good times, bad times, good health, poor health. When I'm facing a, a long, productive life or when I have no hope of recovery. When I'm getting what I want and when not a thing ever seems to go right for me. Full commitment to Jesus means it is not about me and what I can get out of life. It is about Jesus, period. Partial commitment to anything is never really good. <laughs> when I came across this, I, I thought about the time I shared with you that I jumped off a cliff into a, into a, 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 a river. And I thought, well, that really, I was fully committed to that. But I, I thought back, I said, man, if I wasn't fully committed to that, that could have gone wrong really, really easily. I mean, can you imagine? I'm running up to jump off the cliff, and I'm thinking, yeah, do I really want to do this, don't I? I stumble on my foot, next thing I know, I'm sticking out of a rock down below. Partial commitment to anything is never really good. Partial commitment to Jesus puts us at risk. And the risk is this. We imagine something is more important than our relationship with Jesus. And so we, in essence, hand Jesus over to get what we want in life. Some people I know and you know have handed over Jesus to get a, 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 a better grade in school. I've known people who have handed over Jesus to have a certain man become their husband or a certain woman become their wife. I've known people who have handed Jesus over for a career move or when they mail in their taxes, or simply to make money, or to make the guilt go away, or to get anger to go away, or even to be willingly blinded to the path they have taken in life because, because they don't want to confront it. So they throw Jesus under the bus so they don't have to worry about thinking about it. Judas is not that different from us. 
We like to think Judas is this horrible, evil thing with nothing good about him, but that's not necessarily true. No one suspected Judas besides Jesus. The disciples liked Judas. He was one of them. In fact, he was out preaching the gospel with the other disciples. He helped out. He followed Jesus very personally. Judas was so trusted that they let him handle the money. And who's to say at some level Judas didn't appreciate Jesus? He just couldn't place Jesus first. And as a result, something else became more important in his life. Notice and keep in mind that it is not an unconscious act on the part of Judas. He knows what he's doing. Judas sees what he wants and he sacrifices one thing to get another. He is fully aware when he makes his choice. Judas follows Jesus. He is with Jesus every day, day in, day out. And he sits under Jesus' teaching. He participates in everything, but when push comes to shove, Jesus is not his first priority. Maybe Judas thought that he could make Jesus a priority later on. Sometimes we do that, don't we? Yeah, Jesus, I'll make you a priority later. When things cool down, when I get what I want, then you'll become my priority. Mark contrasts these two, Judas and Mary, and be aware that this is not primarily about money. It's about commitment. If we look at verse 3, Jesus is having dinner in Bethany. That's a suburb of Jerusalem. And he's at the house of a man that is apparently uh, known to the readers of Mark's gospel, and they just call him by his nickname, and this man was Simon the leper. But of course, he was not a leper anymore. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been sitting with him, right? He had been healed. My guess is Jesus healed him. And the meal was probably part of this Passover celebration and it was leading up to a night in Passover. And this woman who is not named but revealed again in the Gospel of John as, as Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, uh, that's in John 12, 3, she arrives with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume. And it was made of what they call pure nard. Now, I, I had to do some research on this. The ancients uh, thought that alabaster would preserve the aroma. So this was a jar of choice. And the jar was quite small. It was permanently sealed. So when it was opened, you had to break the top of it. A long neck. And this type of alabaster jar would be for one use and one use only. The scent is extracted from the root, native to India, so they probably obviously ex uh, imported it. Uh, maybe it was grown locally, I don't know, but most likely it would have been in a base of pistachio oil. I don't even know what that is. I, I eat pistachios, but I, I don't know what pistachio oil is. But apparently it was a very, very exotic um, merchandise. Very, very expensive. Now, I didn't know how expensive. I always read this passage, and as I did some research, um, I found out. I'll get to that in a second. So Mary comes in, and she pours the oil on Jesus. It breaks the bottle, pours this expensive oil on Jesus' head, which would have been a, a traditional way to anoint somebody. And I want us to understand, this is what got me this week. Jesus let her do it. He didn't stop. I would have said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't, I don't want a lot of land. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a meal here. Jesus did not stop her. He allowed her to do this. No hesitation on his part. Why? That was the question I asked myself. Why? And I think because he knew her heart and the reason and the worship that she was giving to him. 
Now, everyone else, they're offended. And it's not just because it's uh, interrupting the meal. She's anointing was apparently not unusual at feasts, but really, we're at the Passover meal. He's, what are you doing? But that's not all they were upset about. The thing that was scandalous, the thing that they were really upset about is because they knew how much it cost. They knew the great cost of this nard. <laughs> now here at this feast, it's clear Mary is using the anointing as a sign of pure devotion and thanksgiving. But people don't see that except Jesus. And this enormous value of this nard prevented them from seeing the act of devotion that Mary was giving to Jesus. And at this time during Passover, it was custom to remember the poor with gifts. It was also a practice to give as uh, charity almost a second time during this Passover feast. So this, this is why they were so upset. What this woman did was a total waste. She could have sold that. She could have given to the poor. And traditionally, she would have skipped using it, sold it, and gave the money away in honor of Jesus. But here she breaks it and pours it on his head. This perfume was so expensive. Scholars say it was a yearly wage. And that doesn't connect with us necessarily. So let me try to make it connect with us. Let's look at it this way. How much do you make in a year? 50,000, 100,000, 150,000. It's like this. This woman's act of piety is seen as extravagant. This woman's act is seen as obscene. She takes something that is worth the price of a yearly salary. And then she flaunts it. What could have provided care for so many people for so long was just thrown away like that? It's gone in an instant. Imagine $150,000, boom, gone. I know certainly that I would have been taken back by this act. I mean, I'm cheap. I mean, I pick up my students at Starbucks almost every day. I never get my coffee at Starbucks. I go to the local gas station and fly. Starbucks is too expensive. I'm not paying four bucks for a cup of coffee. But usually this type of anointing is an indication of, of great joy and festivity, but Jesus saw a deeper meaning. Jesus, he defends this woman Placing her act in perspective, he looks beyond the future of the gospel. Jesus loves what she has done, and he says in verse 6, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Jesus is thrilled, he's excited, he's touched tremendously by her act of devotion. And I wonder, as she poured the oil on his head, did Jesus have tears in his eyes? This woman, she is much like that widow that we talked about several Sundays ago. She came in and she took everything that she had, two little pennies or whatever it was, and she put it in. And Jesus said, what she has done is more precious than anyone else because it was all she had. Jesus says what Mary did was an act of full devotion, of full commitment. And it's an act that is in stark contrast to the act that Judas is about to commit. There was a retired man I heard about, and he became interested in construction, uh, particularly about this particular shopping mall that was going on. 
And so he would go down every day, because it was built close to his house, and he would go down to the construction site on a regular basis, and he became extremely impressed by this uh, conscientious operator of a tractor, crane. And he watched him and watched him and watched him. He was amazed. And the operator knows, noticed that this, uh, this man, this retired guy, um, kept coming and doing what he did. And the day, day, day family that came, when the retiree had a chance to tell the operator how much he enjoyed watching his incredible work, how much he admired him. And the operator was totally taken back by the retiree's comments. And the operator replied, you mean you're not a supervisor? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we only give when we know that we're watched by others. But Mary gave. She didn't care who watched. Sometimes we do what's in our heart because it gets us what we want. Mary was willing to give, and so she gave. But again, don't think in terms of money, think in terms of devotion. Mary had somehow acquired this perfume herself, probably maybe her own use, maybe it was a gift, maybe we have speculated that it was a heirloom that was handed down for generations. It doesn't really matter. It was really, really expensive. And Mary does this incredible thing. However, she got it, and here's the key. She doesn't hold back. She breaks the bottle and pours the whole thing on Jesus' head to anoint him. My son, Nate, uh, he, uh, when he went down for graduation, he said, our friends came with us. And one of the, the friends uh, came down with us. And uh, my son, Nate, received this gift from one of those friends. And uh, it was a watch. It was a gorgeous watch. And Nate brought it to me. You know, I was in the back bedroom. He came to me and goes, Dad, he goes, I, what do I do? I, how can I receive this? Because there was a price tag that was still in the bottom of the box, and it was $1,500. And he was destroyed. Dad, this is way too much. This is over the top. This is. And I remember saying to him, I told him, your brother loves you, so accept it humbly and treasure it. Jesus may confuse us a bit as modern people when he says in verse 7, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. And this does not have to do with eliminating poverty or, or, or not eliminating poverty. The point is devotion to Jesus is key here. We see Jesus talking about not always having him with them. And this is reference to obviously his impending death on the cross, which nobody seemed to be clued in on, except maybe Mary. I don't know if she had insight that others didn't concerning the upcoming crucifixion. I doubt it, but we see that she was totally devoted to Jesus. What caused her that day to take that bottle of perfume to anoint Jesus' head at that particular moment in time? I don't know, but she did not hesitate. She did not consider the cost because it didn't matter to her. Jesus did. Sometimes we have a habit of throwing out hesitations when it comes to a full devotion to Jesus Christ. Remember, this whole story is in contrast to Judas. 
Mary parallels that poor widow that we saw earlier. Each gave a crazy amount. The widow may be a quarter of a cent, but it's all her have. Mary, maybe over 150,000 equal to today. But if this is not a money issue, we see Jesus was impressed by both these women. And this is because of their full commitment and devotion to him. A full commitment in contrast to Judas who, who moves his commitment to Jesus aside in favor of getting another thing that he wants. Mary and the poor widow, they let it go. Mary let it go. Yeah, it's a year's wage. But this is Jesus. So there is no sacrifice here. It's Jesus. What these women did was because of their commitment and love and not in terms of money. In our society, money is what trips many of us up. And I have talked with so many that felt that they couldn't get over the mission. Money issue. I have a, a, a guy that I can remember talking with and he said, God has called me to ministry. And I said, well, that's great. Where are you going? What are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard right now. I want to become financially independent, and then I can go and get my education. He never went into ministry. Never went. The cost was too great. We all want security for your future, for our future. It might be money or health or other things, but sometimes those things get in the way of a full commitment to Jesus Christ. And Judas gave in. Mary and the widow gave out. They let go. Judas could not let go, but Mary could. Judas had circumstances surrounding him that were not working out as he had hoped they might. So instead of placing his faith in Jesus Christ, despite the circumstances, he stepped in to address the issue himself. And we all know how that turned out. Mary, not knowing, had no clue how her gift could possibly be appreciated. It was what she had. And Jesus said, everywhere this woman's story will be told. Mary, not knowing how her gift could possibly mean more than an outrageous act, following the Holy Spirit, she becomes one of the most highly honored by Jesus himself. So, the question is to us, are we going to be like a Mary, or are we going to be like a Jesus? Are we going to get a full commitment? All right, we're just going to do the partial part. And I think that's what Mark was trying to get across to us, to show us Mary's full commitment to Jesus. No holds barred. And show us that Judas, very calculated, very planned, but the commitment, the devotion, no, wasn't there. And partial commitment, they've done really work well. Really and therefore, we celebrate the cross each and every week because God gave us his everything because of his devotion to us, because he loves us. Why, it makes no sense, but it is. And so like Jesus, we take that gift that he gave us. Salvation, eternal life, Understanding they cost him a tremendous amount and he sacrificed without even a second thought. And reminds us every week because I love you.